On this Friday night, the push to crush the curve again. New urgency to stop COVID-19 cases from climbing. Now is the time for Canadians to redouble the efforts. As the Bloc Québécois leader reveals he's tested positive, Quebec police sent on a mission to catch rule breakers. We have to do everything in our power to avoid this second wave. The punishment and the concerns with current protocols. Tempers flare over lobster fishing. Oh, what is it? Just say it. Oh, it. it. The escalating dispute between Indigenous harvesters and commercial fishers. And making the leap, the young Canadian rising up in the ranks of the NBA. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. Lots to get to on this Friday night as cases of COVID-19 keep inching up in parts of this country. There's debate about whether we're in a second wave. Many communities have managed to keep a lid on the virus, but some of Canada's most populated regions have not. Canada's top doctor says there is still time to avoid a full-blown second wave, but the clock is ticking. If everybody does what we know to be trying and true measures, this thing can again be turned around in terms of uh, um, a de-escalation. Here's where the infection rates are growing fastest. BC reported 179 cases today, though 40 of those are older cases that weren't added to the data until today. There were 107 new infections in Alberta, 297 new cases in Quebec, and in Ontario, 401 more people tested positive. That's the biggest daily jump since early June. In Ontario, tough new restrictions on social gatherings are now in force in Ottawa, Peel Region and Toronto. And Premier Doug Ford said today more restrictions are coming into other parts of the province to crack down on partiers who aren't obeying the rules. Toronto's mayor is getting fed up too and he warns new rules could be on the way. The bottom line is that the status quo has us on a path that is uh, very deeply troubling uh, and uh, we've got to try and arrest uh, that uh, trend uh, as quickly as we possibly can. Are we at the start of what we've been repeatedly told is coming? Federal health officials say it's too soon to say this is the second wave, but the chief medical officer for the city of Ottawa says the data in her city is clear. She says Ottawa is in the midst of a second wave because people became too relaxed. There have been 60 new cases in three days and high demand for testing. At one facility this morning, so many people showed up, the centre reached its capacity by 9 a.m. Another reminder today, anyone can get COVID-19, including our political leaders. Bloc Québécois leader Yves-François Blanchet announced today he's been diagnosed with the virus. The entire Bloc caucus is self-isolating. And so is federal Conservative leader Aaron O'Toole. He is still waiting for his test results after a staffer tested positive. David Aiken joins me from Ottawa. David, let's start with Blanchet. How is he doing and do we know how he caught it? Well, it seems he's doing well enough, Donna. He did tweet out today that he and his wife are in self-isolation at their home in Shawinigan, Quebec. Now, public health officials will try to determine where Blanchet got the virus. We do know that he and the other Bloc MPs held a caucus retreat recently, and there was a staff member at that retreat who was subsequently diagnosed with COVID-19. Now, as for O'Toole... Uh, no word in his test result yet likely will not come until Saturday. David, a group of premiers went to Ottawa today to deliver a wish list to the federal government. What are they asking for? Well, they want what they always want from Ottawa, Donna, more money. And this time the ask is for an increase of $70 billion in federal transfers to the provinces for health care. The federal government's contribution levels are the lowest they've been. The demand is the highest it's been prior to COVID. Now we have an opportunity to focus on fixing the system. Nothing right now is more important to Canadians than health care. Because without health care, we have nothing. If we don't have our health, we don't have an economy. Now, as for the Trudeau government, it sounds like it's ready to consider some proposals. But the priority that premiers attach to uh, an accessible, high-quality health care system is one that we share. And David, a final question about the COVID Alert app. The federal government launched it weeks ago, but it only went live in two provinces, Ontario and Newfoundland and Labrador. Are other provinces now signing on? 
Yes. So as of today, New Brunswick and Saskatchewan residents are able to download and use this app. Other provinces, including Alberta and B.C., are, are ready to do it, just working out some technical details. But there is one holdout, Quebec. Uh, we took a unanimous, unanimous uh, decision. So we are four different parties at the National Assembly in Quebec City, and all of us, uh, we want to wait because there are uh, some concerns about uh, the protection of personal data. Now, those MNAs in Quebec's National Assembly apparently have not been swayed by the verdicts of the federal and Ontario privacy commissioners. They have no problems with the app. It does not track your location. It does not track any personal info. But to be effective in helping stem the spread of COVID-19, it definitely needs more Canadians in more provinces to download it and use it. Donna? Okay. David Aiken in Ottawa. Thanks. Some breaking news from Ottawa. The president of the Public Health Agency of Canada has resigned after less than 18 months in the job. She says she needs a break. In an email to employees today, Tina Naminiowski said it was a difficult decision, but said none of us are superhuman and she needs to step away. She said you really need someone who will have the energy and stamina to take the agency and our response to the next level. Canada's public health agency has come under criticism for its initial response to COVID-19. Some scientists allege their early warnings went ignored. Nami Niowski said the next president will be named early next week. An outbreak at an Edmonton school appears to have been caused by the province's first case of transmission within a school. Two people from Waverly Elementary have tested positive. A dozen students and seven staff members are self-isolating now for two weeks. The province's chief medical health officer says the virus was likely transmitted from one of the infected individuals to the other. And BC is rolling out a new way to test school-aged children for COVID-19. Children aged 4 to 19 will be able to use a mouth rinse instead of the often uncomfortable nasal swab. Kids will have to swish and gargle a sterile saltwater solution before spitting it into a tube. The test can be done without the assistance of a healthcare professional. This method is believed to be one of the first of its kind in the world. The province hopes to eventually make the new spit test available to everyone. Quebec is getting tougher on people who break public health rules. Police officers will be fanning out across that province this weekend, checking on 1,000 bars and restaurants to make sure safety protocols are being enforced. Though, as Mike Armstrong explains, bar owners insist they are not the real problem. The Quebec Public Security Minister was flanked by police chiefs Friday morning announcing Operation Oscar, basically spot checks for hundreds of Quebec bars and restaurants. We have to use every tool at our disposal to avoid a second wave of COVID in Quebec. In Montreal alone, 40 officers have been assigned specifically to look for rule breakers this weekend. Things like people not wearing a mask when walking around or drinking while standing. First-time offenders could face fines of $400 to $1,000, repeat offenders even more. The law says that you can have a fine between $1,000 and $6,000. Now, there have been outbreaks in Quebec bars. In one case, a single night of karaoke led to close to 100 positive tests. Well, after that incident, the province banned karaoke, forced bars and restaurants to keep a registry of patrons, and mandated last call at midnight. This bar owner says that's not doing anything but costing him money and creating another problem. Do you think on the weekend they're going to go home? They're not going to go home. Somebody's going to stand up and say, hey, let's go to my place. Let's do a party. The Justice Minister says private parties are another concern. Gatherings with more than 10 people are banned, indoor and outdoor. The government's also looking at public events like this baseball game. It included an on-field celebration that seemed completely free of concern over COVID-19, including from the uniformed, unmasked police officers who were on site to ensure people were respecting COVID-19 protocols. Their chief said Friday she's investigating what went wrong. Mike Armstrong, Global News, Montreal. It is September. A second wave is what public health officers have been warning us repeatedly is coming. With schools reopening and more people back at work, the risk of COVID-19 spreading goes up. As Eric Sorensen reports, it's unclear, though, what exactly we can expect. 
Oh, I think it's coming back. Winter is coming, and Kevin Wallace senses COVID-19 is coming back from its summer lull. Everybody's going to be stuck inside. It's going to be a lot harder. Marta Pastor says it's already different. As long as we have these 40-year-olds and under that don't comply. Young people are getting COVID-19 at a much higher percentage now than last spring. Luckily, not as many need to be hospitalized. At midweek, hospitalizations in the four biggest provinces were rising, but far from overtaxing a health care system with thousands of beds. Still, when case numbers rise, worse outcomes often follow. If numbers do remain going in the wrong direction and people are then pointing and saying, well, the hospitalizations are fine, it's only a matter of time before that indicator catches up. A resurgence of COVID-19 should not come as a surprise. As early as last April, before the leaves were out, public health models suggested what was ahead. Don't expect that curve to flatten out entirely. What with getting back to somewhat normal life, you can expect to see some waves in the fall and possibly the winter. So fast forward almost five months after the mass infections in the spring, after getting back to somewhat normal life over the summer, now we are seeing again a rise in cases up 58% over a 14 day period in September. But a second surge will not be a repeat of the spring. Many things have changed, some for the better. Hospitals have improved care and better drug treatment. Long-term care facilities have reorganized staffing and access. There is more testing and more people wear masks now. We're definitely more prepared now uh, than, than we were back in the spring. Not only do uh, organizations know what they have to do, public health organizations, health care organizations, the government is more familiar with it. We have a lot more experience with this and people are more understanding of what they need to do. But some risks are increasing too. We're socializing more now, not less. We're sending children to school instead of sending them home. And contact tracing is still lagging behind. And we're all kind of fed up with the whole routine. We're acting like caged tigers. You know, there's a lot more at stake than just people being, you know, tired of being at home. A new surge of COVID-19 seems inevitable, but what remains unknown is how bad it will get, who will get it, and what the next curve will actually look like. Eric Sorensen, Global News, Toronto. One thing we do know, long-term care homes in Canada have been the epicenter of the COVID-19 outbreaks here. Most of the deaths in Canada were people living in long-term care. And in Ontario right now, there are still 22 long-term care homes with active outbreaks. As Mike Lucature reports, many facilities aren't ready for another hit. In nearly three weeks, there have been eight deaths related to COVID-19 at this Ottawa long-term care home. 54 patients and staff have also tested positive for the virus at the Extendicare West End Villa in Ottawa. Numbers that prompted Ontario Premier Doug Ford to call out the operators of the home. They're a good company, but it took one long-term care worker to go in there that was infected and it went through there like an Australian bushfire. In response, Extendicare said they are testing their employees regularly, blaming testing backlogs in Ottawa, saying, quote, if we don't receive the results fast enough, we cannot effectively cohort and protect our people. But Canada's chief medical officer believes the country's long-term care homes are more prepared for the next wave, but... I certainly remain concerned that probably not enough is being done in every facility, in every single f um, uh, of these homes need to really show up their measures. Including staffing. Long-term care facilities across the country struggled with keeping workers during the early months of the pandemic. And some say little has been done to address it. We need their help in uh, mobilizing an army to come in. Not the army, but a new army of, uh, of workers. Quebec's response was to increase wages and fast-track training for personal support workers, which led to the hiring of 10,000 new people. Premier Ford says Ontario support workers are underpaid and overworked. But so far, the province hasn't boosted wages. I'm all over health right now to get this through Treasury uh, as, as soon as possible. We can attract more people. The provinces won't be able to count on volunteer resources from hospitals and school boards like they did in the spring leaving some frontline workers at a loss. I don't really know what more we can do than to hope and pray that it won't uh, be as bad as it was the first time around. Not exactly reassuring as the country braces for a second wave. Mike LeCouture, Global News, Ottawa. A fight over lobster fishing coming up, the contentious battle between Acadians and Mi'kmaq in Nova Scotia. 
There's a dispute going on in Nova Scotia that has deep roots. It's about who is entitled to fish for lobster, and it's pitting Indigenous harvesters against commercial fishers, many of whom are of Acadian descent. They all want the same thing, to use plentiful lobster grounds to keep their families financially afloat. But agreeing on how to do that is not just contentious, it's turning violent. Ross Lord is in Saunierville, Nova Scotia. Ross, what's been happening? Well, Donna, this dispute is a long-standing conflict and no one seems to be able to reconcile it. For Nova Scotia's Sebag and Agate First Nation, these moments are historic, issuing seven licenses to start its own self-regulated lobster industry. My son is a fisherman, but also, um, you know, it's uh, his children, you know, my, our grand, my grandchildren, you know, that's their rights. And uh, if we don't protect those rights and assert those rights today, um, you know, what's going to be left for them? But after Mi'kmaq fishers dumped their traps, their lines were cut. This as hundreds of commercial lobster harvesters protest what they consider an out-of-season fishery. They should fish when, when we fish. Commercial boats took turns skirting the tied-up indigenous boats. Keep doing it! We love it! At the nearby Weymouth Wharf, confrontations turned bitter. RCMP are on site in an effort to maintain order. They have their treaty rights, which gives them some extra stuff. Whether you like it or not, that ain't going anywhere. Sebag and Agate timed the new fishery to coincide with the anniversary of the Supreme Court of Canada's 1999 Marshall decision. That ruling upheld the treaty rights of Indigenous harvesters to fish outside the commercial season for a, quote, moderate livelihood. But 21 years later, there's still no common understanding of what that means. What is a modern livelihood? That's got to be discussed more than anything. Because I've seen you causing a lot of trouble at the other wars, no, rubbing you your belly everywhere. I think it's the minister that needs to come up to a solution because both, both parties are, shouldn't be here fighting. In a statement, Fisheries Minister Bernadette Jordan says she's deeply concerned about escalating tensions. Jordan says she's working with First Nations leadership to find a collaborative path. But she says until there's an agreement with DFO, there cannot be a commercial fishery outside the commercial season. Okay. The Sebag and Agate chief suggests he doesn't trust the minister. The fisheries minister is heavily influenced, living in a fishing village herself. So maybe, um, maybe she should be replaced with somebody that's more of a neutral um, understanding of how it's going to work. New lobster traps have arrived, signaling Sebag and Agate First Nation is determined to forge ahead. Well, the RCMP say they've arrested two people, both for assault, and they're investigating other complaints, including mischief and uttering threats. An RCMP statement says members will remain in the Saulnierville area, on land and on the water, to keep the peace. Donna? All right, Ross Lord in Nova Scotia tonight. Thank you. Still ahead, the risk those fighting California's wildfires take. Watching Global National. Those fierce wildfires raging along America's west coast have claimed another life, this time a firefighter. He died fighting the massive El Dorado wildfire in California's San Bernardino National Forest. The blaze erupted after a botched fireworks display at a gender reveal party on the Labor Day long weekend. He is the 26th person to die in the fires that have consumed California this summer. From Kitchener, Ontario to the NBA Finals, next Canada's unstoppable shooting star. There is one player right now who is considered the spark fueling the Denver Nuggets' thrilling run in the NBA playoffs. Jamal Murray single-handedly launched the team in tonight's Western Conference Finals, showing up stars like Kawhi Leonard. As Mike Drolet explains, being born and raised in Canada might have something to do with it. Jamal Murray was always good at basketball, but in the last few weeks he's developed an exciting new skill, making overconfident sports pundits eat their words. Uh, everybody counts us out. Uh, and it's, just fun to, it's just fun to silence everybody. We love it. Growing up in Kitchener, Ontario, not exactly a basketball mecca, you could say Murray got used to it. I, remember, I think I found him at 14 or 15. 
And I remember calling the, our, our, our national team coach at that time in that age, and I said, look, I just found the guy that's going to start for us. And sure enough, as an 18-year-old, Murray was starting for Team Canada. How he got to be so darn good is a tale unto itself. When other kids were watching TV or playing video games, Murray's dad, Roger, had him playing basketball or working out. And in the winter, he dribbled a ball on ice rinks and did push-ups in the snow, willingly. You would never say that, um, you know, Jamal's dad's overbearing. He's a soft-spoken, smooth guy, right? Real dope guy. One of the guys. He doesn't really put himself above anyone else in the crowd. All that hard work has now thrust the younger Murray into a starring role, leading his underdog Denver Nuggets into a clash with LeBron James and the L.A. Lakers. He's a ways to go before anybody starts comparing him to retired star Steve Nash, but Canada's best active player might also be the hottest player on the planet right now. He says excelling at basketball has been his singular goal in life, but he's made room in his off-seasons to give back to Kitchener. Last year, he built new basketball courts in an area that badly needed help. Yeah, the basketball courts, it's amazing. Um, and those kids now have a safe area to play. And you know, that's what I had growing up. That's what that's where I had a court like that. And you know, I kept me out of trouble a lot of times. And uh, As you can see, he that, rarely shows his emotions in interviews. But as his profile grows, so is his confidence. And Murray has embraced the message of Black Lives Matter. The deaths of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd hit him hard. And he's using his voice and his shoes to draw attention to the issues of equality and racial justice. It doesn't take me, a 23-year-old, to recognize that that's not right. That, that should be in, in everybody's mind. Um, if you don't see it that way, then, then there's a problem with you. And it's becoming clear that if you don't see Murray as an ascendant superstar, that's on you, too. Mike Drolet, Global News, Toronto. And that is Global National for this Friday. I'm Donna Friesen. Tonight's Year Canada is this freshly cut alfalfa field in Pinocchio, Alberta. I can smell it from here. Thanks for watching. Rosh Hashanah, Jewish New Year begins this evening. To those of you observing this special time, we wish you all the best. Bye bye.